Breaking news. We have breaking news out of the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals in the case of Oakland Tactical versus the township of Howell dealing with whether or not in the state of Michigan you can have restrictions on whether or not you can build thousand-yard shooting ranges and whether or not that's protected by the Second Amendment, including, by the way, by the Militia Clause. Let's talk all about it when we get back. Major oral argument just occurred. Hey, folks, I'm Mark Smith, host of the Four Box of Diner, proud American gun owner, constitutional attorney, member of the United States Supreme Court Bar, and author of Disarmed, What the Ukraine War Teaches Americans About the Right to Bear Arms. All right, folks, we just had a major oral argument in the United States Court of Appeals for the Sixth Circuit, the Sixth Circuit out of Michigan. The name of the case is Oakland Tactical versus Township of Howell. I'll put a link to the argument down below. Now, this is a very interesting case with a lot to learn from it, with some major implications to the Second Amendment. To begin with, this is a case involving a company, Oakland Tactical, that wants to build on agricultural land in the township of Howell a 1,000-yard shooting range. Now, I should note that the Civilian Marksmanship Program has uh, contests and training at 1,000 yards, just by way of context. I should also note that uh, the township appears to be, as best as the at least according to the allegations in the complaint, uh, basically doesn't seem to be big fans of guns and doesn't like the idea of having a gun range that has a 1,000 yard range. By the way, apparent according to the allegations in the complaint, uh, Oakland Tactical also wants to operate on its property, not just the range uh, for 1,000 yards for qualified shooters, but it also wants to allow for uh, rifle, shotgun, and handgun ranges for the general public. Um, of you know the normal lengths as well as the thousand yard uh, range as well. Uh, the township has barred the operation of these shooting ranges on Oakland Tactical's land, which they own this property. And this of course effectively bars, uh, at least according to the allegations, the operation of these ranges in the township all throughout the township. So the town was sued, claiming this violated the second amendment. Now, this is the first quick thing I want you to understand. The text of the Second Amendment says the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Nowhere on the text does it refer to the right to train. Nowhere does it talk about operating gun ranges. Nowhere does it talk about uh, thousand yard ranges or any of these things. Nevertheless, we understand under basic constitutional law, that you have such things often referred to as ancillary rights that are derivative to the Bill of Rights. I'll give you an example. First Amendment. So the First Amendment speaks to, among other things, the right to free speech, the right to freedom of the press, the right to freedom of religion. So historically, courts have interpreted that text i.e. the text of the First Amendment, to include things like the right to expressive association, the right to gather news, the right to receive information, perhaps the right to attend criminal trials to report on it. And as you know from the Supreme Court case that we've talked about of Minneapolis Star from 1984, I believe, you had a Supreme Court decision that says that attacks on ink is unconstitutional, even though the word ink does not appear in the text of the First Amendment, because there are these derivative or ancillary rights that stem from the text. So too is it the case with the Second Amendment's text, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Now, for those of you who like to uh, comment and write the words shall not be infringed, I agree with you. But you're going to get your day here on the Four Box of Dan uh, Diner's uh, Second Amendment channel specifically because today we're going to laser focus on what the word infringed means, as in shall not be infringed, because that plays a big role in this case between Oakland Tactical versus the Township of Howell. Now, I should mention that what happened is at the trial court level, the U.S. District Court level, there's a motion to dismiss made by 
the township that was granted. And thus, this case is on appeal, and the question presented on appeal in the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals right now, at oral argument in front of three judges, is whether or not a claim has been stated by the plaintiffs that banning these uh, shooting ranges, these gun ranges, including the 1,000-yard range, whether or not this violates the Second Amendment's right to keep and bear arms. Now, turning to the text of the Second Amendment as to whether or not this is true, and by the way, before this video is over, I will play some of the argument for you so you can hear the argument being made on behalf of the Second Amendment on, and on behalf of Oakland Tactical uh, in this case. So you can hear some of the specific arguments right from the horse's mouth. But anyway, let's talk about the text for a moment. What does infringe mean? So when you all text to me or you all uh, put a comment below that says, shall not be infringed, what are you really saying? What does infringe mean? Well, as you know, that since the Second Amendment's text, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed, arose in the year of our Lord, 1791. That's when it was ratified. We must look back in time to 1791 and that founding era to understand what those words meant. Because just like a contract entered into today, you want to understand what the words of the contract meant to the parties that enter into the contract. And what did the parties who entered into the contract understand that language to mean? And what was the purpose of the contract today? doesn't matter what people think about it 100 years from now. It's what did the contract mean today to the parties that entered into it? So too, when we, the people, the American people, entered into the contract, the social contract of the United States Constitution in 1791 and thereabouts, of course, uh, what did the people understand? What was the original public understanding, the original public meaning of the words of the Second Amendment in the Constitution, and what was to be protected? So to do that, of course, one of the most basic ways the Supreme Court always do is, does is they simply go back to the founding era and they review dictionaries uh, and understand the words that were used because obviously the founding fathers would have used these dictionaries to define their terms, among other things. So if you go back to the uh, founding era, we know that the U.S. Supreme Court views two sources to be particularly insightful. One are a, dic a dictionary by uh, Samuel Johnson, who was an English lexicographer. A lexicographer is the compiler of a dictionary or dictionaries. And Samuel Johnson and also, of course, the first American lexicographer, Noah Webster. Noah Webster. Noah Webster wanted to do an American English dictionary because he didn't like the British and wanted to have American English to find and not just English, English, I la Tory English. So what did both Samuel Johnson and Noah Webster say about the word infringed? Well, as it turns out, they basically agree on what it means in the word, in the definition of infringed under the English language, and that is simply to hinder or to destroy. To hinder or to destroy, either one. So here you have the banning out by the allegation in the complaint uh, the banning on shooting ranges, which obviously has the implication of affecting the right to keep and bear arms. Because as we know from the United States Court of Appeals and the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals out of Chicago, Illinois, uh, Illinois, in the Rhonda Izell versus Chicago case from many years ago, the right to keep and bear arms implies or has an ancillary right, the right to train. Because as the Supreme Court says, the purpose of the right to keep arms is to be ready in anticipation of a potential violent confrontation where you might need to use your guns to defend yourself against any and all forms of tyranny, whether that tyranny is in the form of a wild animal, a street criminal, a foreign invader, uh, a tyrannical government, whatever. You have to be at the ready for a violent confrontation where you can use your arms to defend yourself, your family, and your community. That's the idea of the Second Amendment. It's a self-defense component. It's a self-defense idea. Of course, that also includes hunting as well as all lawful purposes, but self-defense plays a crucial role about the in, ter in terms of the purpose of the Second Amendment. So therefore, the Azell case, the Seventh Circuit, said obviously the right to keep arms requires the right to be ready to front arm confrontation, and that encompasses, of course, the right to train. So because that involves the right to train, anything that hinders or destroys the right to trade obviously implicates the text of the Second Amendment, i.e. the right of the people to keep their arms shall not be infringed. And here the allegation goes because the township of Howell is restricting the ability of, of uh, these shooting ranges, the ability to create a range on agricultural zone land. This is implicating the right to train as well as the right to provide training by uh, Oakland Tactical. There was some debate at this oral argument um, involving this case as to whether or not Oakland Tactical as a commercial operator of a range, conceptually at least, 
they haven't turned it on, I don't believe, but if they were, uh, why does that implicate the parties, you know, why does it implicate the right of others to be able to uh, train? In other words, yes, I want to turn on a commercial establishment for a shooting range, but it's not my ability to shoot that's being implicated. It's the ability or the right of others to come to my range to uh, train. So how do, does that implicate the right of the people to keep their arms to uh, shall not be infringed? And I think obviously the lawyer made a very strong argument here to say, well, you can't, uh, people have to have a place to go train. And if you prevent people from opening up shooting ranges, you are implicating the right of people to train and hindering it. It would be no different than if you ban said, well, you, you, you can buy guns, but we're going to close down all commercial gun shops all across America. Well, obviously, you would hinder the ability of people to acquire firearms. And so, too, the ability, you know, by, your, by banning um, these ranges in the township, you are implicating and hindering the ability of people to train, which has, by extension, you're hurting and hindering the right of the people to keep in their arms because they cannot train and be in proficient in the use of arms in the event that they need it. So with all of this said, the first lesson, again, is you have these ancillary rights that don't necessarily appear expressly on the face of the text of the Second Amendment, but they are protected by it. I think another one, in addition to the right to train, would obviously be the right to acquire guns. Uh, we're not born with guns. We have to acquire guns to be able to exercise the right to keep in their arms. And there's two basic ways you acquire guns. One is to buy them and the other is to make them. So those are two other examples I would say are clearly implicated by the text of the Second Amendment, even though it does not use specifically the words buy or sell or make guns in the text of the Second Amendment. But those would be, I would I would say, clearly examples of ancillary rights, just like the right to train is according to the Azell case in the Seventh Circuit. And of course, I think that's kind of understood here by the Sixth Circuit. Uh, with that said, You'll see in this audio here, some of the issues associated with this are, well, how does the text implicate it? I'll play a video right here so you can see the argument. And let's go to the tape now so you can hear this quick argument uh, right from the horse's mouth, the lawyers for Oakland Tactical. Uh, the district court erred in this case by holding that the plain text of the Second Amendment does not protect training with firearms. And the township has forfeited its ability to provide any historical justifications for its restrictions on training. Therefore, this court should reverse and hold that the township is in violation of the Second Amendment. Now, the next interesting part I want to play from this argument is very fascinating because it actually speaks to the right to create a militia, arguably. It specifically talks about militias and the ability to train uh, associated with training for a militia. Uh, specifically, there's a discussion here about how obviously uh, well, well, part of it is there's a colloquy going back and forth between the judges and the lawyer, and the judges are like, well, why do you need a thousand yard range? And I think that's kind of the same kind of question you might see. This is, well, why do you need a 50 round magazine or a 30 round magazine? Well, we know, of course, to begin with, that Heller says that it is not enough to say that, well, why do you need a handgun? Remember, in, in Heller, D.C. argued that you don't need a handgun and handguns are not protected by the Second Amendment because you were allowed to have rifles and shotguns in the District of Columbia. So therefore, you didn't need to have a handgun because there was other ways or other means they had given you. And the Supreme Court says that is not an argument. You cannot say, well, you know, you, we have these other ways to exercise your Second Amendment rights so we can take away your right to a handgun. And that's where the Heller Court says that is not a valid argument under the Second Amendment. And of course, I think that applies here because there's this colloquy going back and forth. Is, well, why do you need a thousand yard range? You know, what is the purpose of this? Uh, why can't you just get by with a shorter range? And there's discussion of why that is simply not the case. Of course, part of it is you have the right to hunt because one of the questions, of course, is, well, why can't you, you know, if it's like, you know, you're using a handgun 10 feet away, why do you need a thousand yards? And the discussion, of course, is there is no limitations. Once the right is implicated, uh, meaning the right to keep arms that implicated, or hindered, or destroyed by regulation, that is a violation of the Second Amendment. It's not, it's not allowed by the government to say, well, you can shoot at 500 yards, but not 1,000 yards. And that is, of course, uh, a discussion. So let's go to the tape and see how this is argued by the lawyers for Oakland Tactical. Uh, yeah, that aspect of it. But for Dimitrov and Penrod, they don't have anywhere else to train at all within Hal Township. And they said they want to do the full. Okay, but for the others, training. that is accurate. 1,000 foot outdoor, that's the, this type of training that they uh, can the, do anywhere. It's it's more, it's like an hour apart with traffic. Probably. Yeah, yeah, for others, it's this specific, you know, this would be a uh, unique type of training that is 
offered at this, but that's not the only, I want to add, that's not the only type of training that's at issue here. But okay. with, with respect to the plain text, and here's, I think, what's important. Once the plain text is implicated, there's nothing in the plain text that would allow anyone to draw, okay, you get to train at 100 yards, 500 yards, 1,000 yards, whatever. That would have to come from history to see what type of limitations on training with uh, arms that can be born. We agree it's limited to protected arms. No one disputes that the arms are protected here, that this training is within the common functionality of these protected arms. And so there's nothing in the plain text that would say, okay, you get to train to 80% of the capacity of protected arms and not 100%. Instead, you would have to go to the history and see what sort of restrictions are available. It's the same thing with respect to, for example, the types of arms that are protected. Heller said that as a matter of plain text, all instruments that constitute bearable arms are protected. And so you don't at the textual level say, okay, does someone really need this type of firearm? Uh, would it, would they, could they use something else? Instead, any limitations would have to be gotten from history. And what Heller said is that's the dangerous and unusual slash common use test. That what do we have in the record right, right now? Uh, Judge Catalyst has referred to this a number yeah. of times that would support that the plain text and would encompass constructing and operating a commercial shooting range of 1,000 yard, or I mean, could it be 2,000, 3,000 yards, uh, but a commercial range? Well, what we would have, what we have is that the plain text encompasses training. And so it's, it, again, the right is focused on the individuals. If you bar commercial operation of training, then you drastically restrict the ability to train because you suppress that market. It would be the same thing if you said, uh, you know, no stores selling paper and ink. And it's not that anybody has a right to sell paper and ink. It's that people have a right, a right to write and to speak. And so that would suppress that right. And you could say, well, you know, you could there could be other methods besides commercial operations where you could get paper and ink, but that wouldn't be an answer on the First Amendment. And it's the same as the Second Amendment. Imagine there was a law that said no firearm sales, no commercial operation of gun stores. Uh, you know, you can someone could run a gunsmithing place, you could barter, whatever, but just no commercial operation of gun sales. That would obviously suppress, infringe the right to keep and bear arms by making it uh, suppressing the market for firearms. And this is how constitutional evaluation takes place, you know, in, in several arenas, contraceptive rights, those sorts of things as well. So, uh, and that's what the Supreme Court said, again, uh, four justices in Bruin uh, in, the, in the dissent in the city of New York case said that you have a, a necessary concomitant of the Second Amendment right is to take your gun to a range. It was a range at issue in that case. Same thing in Drummond. Drum what do you do? What do you do about the language that talks about bearing arms in case of confrontation? How does how does the long range aspect of this case fit into that? Well, you have a right to keep and bear arms, and bear, as it said in uh, in Bruin, simply means to carry. And that encompasses caring for confrontation with another person. It would include hunting, as a, I believe the Constitution of Pennsylvania specifically said, people have the right to bear arm, bear arms and for hunting purposes, specifically mentioned. So that could be at issue. And if you have a right to bear an arm, it's a right to bear an arm for all lawful purposes, is what is protected. And if you have a right to ban an arm, there's no justification for saying you can't be trained to the full capacity of that arm, even if you're not going to, in a likely scenario, use it uh, to that full capacity, there's still, I, I don't see any rationale for saying you can't be trained. Being trained in long distance is gonna help you at a shorter distance. And if there's any ambiguity, we go to the prefatory clause, which, set, which deals with the militia. And the whole reason Heller said the second amendment was included in the second amendment was to for the preparation of a well-regulated militia, which meant well-trained, and the use of arms in this sort of long distance training is precisely the type of training that would be valuable in that circumstance. So it fits perfectly with the reason 
that the Second uh, Amendment was included in the Constitution. All right, so to summarize, I just want to give you this quote that I think is significant out of the uh, Rhonda Azell versus Chicago case. This is what the Seventh Circuit said, discuss, discussing their uh, right to train language in prior cases. They said, quote, We held that the core individual right of armed defense includes a corresponding right to acquire and maintain proficiency in firearm use through target practice. In fact, they go on to say that we explained that the core right to possess firearms for protection would not mean much without the training and practice that it would that that you need to make it effective. We noted that the Supreme Court decision in Heller itself supports this understanding. And finally, the Seventh Circuit went on to say we held that the city of Chicago had failed to establish that target practice is wholly unprotected as a matter of history and legal tradition and the founding era or when the 14th Amendment was uh, uh, ratified. And therefore, they went on to say that the holding of these observations control in these cases in the Seventh Circuit, uh, gun range training is not categorically outside the Second Amendment. To the contrary, they went on to say that it lies close to the core of the individual right to self-defense as understood by the Second Amendment. Powerful language from the Seventh Circuit. I think we're going to see similar, if not improved, language from the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals in this case of Oakland Tactical uh, versus the Township of Howell. And I think that uh, I think that the Oakland Tactical is going to win this motion. Uh, I think this case will continue on a very powerful opinion by the Sixth Circuit, but only time will tell. Uh, we'll see what the three-judge panel is. But, of course, even if they win at the Sixth Circuit level, it'll go back to the district court for further proceedings. But, again, I think it'll be a powerful precedent. I do think that the Second Amendment will prevail on this. I think the better arguments are on behalf of the Second Amendment, again, but only time will tell. All right, folks, you hope you're learning a little bit of something here today. Uh, make sure you subscribe. Don't forget to follow me on X at 4 Box Diner for even more Second Amendment information that you'll find on this videos or on this channel. And we will see you again soon here at the 4 Boxes Diner. Orders up. Table 2A.